I'm Dr. Troy Smith, and this is Early U.S. History. A lot of times we refer to it as one of the two survey courses of U.S. history. So there's this one that goes up to the year 1877, and then the second sequence uh, goes from 1877 to the present. So here we're going up to 1877 and starting as far back as we want to go. And by uh, um, survey, like I said, that means it's just kind of a general overview, even though it's going to take, so far as these lectures go, some, somewhere between 40, 45 hours. Also, um, if we were starting technically, officially at U.S. history, we would start July 4th, 1776, when the United States became a thing. But we're going to be looking at pre-United States history as well. Okay, now, I'm assuming that most of you have had some form of U.S. history in the past, of early U.S. history, although it may have been a few years for some of you. But usually, and maybe it's changed, I hope it's changed from when I was, I was in school in the 1970s, but, but usually any discussion of U.S. history, of American history, tends to start with this guy. But do you know what? There was a lot here before this guy. By which, you know, I mean like thousands and thousands and thousands of years of time, of stuff going on. There were people here, a whole lot of people here, before this guy. And they did a lot of very interesting things. And those things are part of American history, right? Because they're happening in the Americas with the original Americans. Therefore, what we're going to do is we're not even going to get to Christopher Columbus for at least a couple of hours, maybe more. We're going to instead spend some time talking about the people who were already here. And we're going to talk uh, a little bit about their culture, in large part because once we do get to European arrival and colonization of what would become the United States, those people are still around, those original people interacting with the early colonists. And if you don't know anything about the indigenous people's culture, and, and history, you're not going to completely understand what's going on because you're only going to understand it from one perspective, one point of view, the point of view of the white people that showed up, which is the point of view that, uh, you know, for centuries, students have mostly, if not completely, gotten. But, you know, I want to get away from that in a little bit. One thing, though, that uh, I would like to address before we get to that is what to call these people who already inhabited the Americas. Now, I hate to bring Columbus again up again so soon, but as you are no doubt aware, he, uh, he thought he was in India, and so he called them Indians, and it stuck, even though everybody else pretty quickly figured out this is not India. And so they were called American Indians for a very long time, or in Spanish, los indios. Is that what they called themselves before Columbus got there? No, uh, of course not. What did they call themselves as a race? They didn't have a word for themselves as a race because what would they compare themselves to? You know, as opposed to, to whom? So they identified themselves by tribe and nation. It was only when white people arrived that different tribes and nations of, of indigenous people had to sort of band together and kind of adopt a name to cover their whole, their whole group. And that, that name was Indians, like I said, for a very long time, until the 1960s when the term Native American started to be used by anthropologists. It wasn't a brand new term. It had been around since the early 1900s, but hardly anyone had used it. Then anthropologists really started pushing that as a more accurate term, right? 
um, because American Indian is inaccurate. Uh, they may have been in America, but they are not and never were from India. They're not Indians. So Native American became uh, started to become commonplace by the 1980s. And by the 1990s, it was the term that everyone was using. And in fact, uh, generally, people considered American Indian to be not only inaccurate, but to be a slur or an insult, calling these people by some other people's name, people in India. Indian Americans probably weren't too thrilled with uh, the term American Indians either. However, however, in 1995, the uh, U.S. Census Bureau, uh, you know, they had like a, it was halfway in between the uh, uh, every decade census, so I guess maybe they had a little extra time on their hands. They did a survey of people who identified, American citizens who identified, who were members of uh, these tribes, who were uh, of indigenous ancestry. Indigenous mean, meaning, you know, from this place. Asking them what term they preferred. And so they had several, several terms. And uh, as it turned out, the majority, by a pretty wide margin, preferred the term American Indian over Native American. Now, not all of them. I think it was 50% preferred American Indian, 37% preferred Native American, and then the other 12 or 13% were divided up among other things. But still, it was a majority uh, preferred the older term. Now, why is that? I've heard different explanations from different people. Uh, by the way, just in case you didn't know, Native American Indian indigenous people still exist. They have not disappeared. Uh, you can easily, well, relatively easily, I guess, depending on where you live, but in this digital age, it shouldn't be hard. Find one and ask them what they think. That's the best thing to do. Now, I have, uh, I have friends who prefer the term Native American and don't like American Indian at all, and then I have far more uh, who prefer American Indian, or at least use it. Anyway, I was, I was saying that I've heard uh, a lot of explanations for why so many indigenous people are okay or even prefer the term American Indian. And those include, I've been told that uh, American Indian is inaccurate, but at least it's something that has been used for a long time. And uh, uh, that's... Uh, uh, has that sort of uh, familiarity with it. Uh, also, I've been told that uh, no one asked them if they wanted to be Native Americans either. Just some anthropologists decided that's what they were. And the public eventually started following along. Another explanation I've heard is that uh, because the term was American Indian for so long, it's in all the documents and in all the treaties and, and so forth. And so... Uh, therefore, it uh, 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 continues to be used. And again, it, it varies by individual. So what I try to do is mix it up a little bit. You know, sometimes I say Native American. Sometimes I say American Indian. Sometimes I say Native American Indian. Sometimes I say Native. Sometimes I say Indigenous. Um, but I just wanted you to know that using the term American Indian... Uh, that is something that uh, particularly academics are getting back to, uh, having uh, ascertained that uh, that's something that a lot of indigenous people like uh, or accept or even, even prefer. And so now, you know, well, the reason I bring this up is because when I tell people that I'm in American Indian studies, they give me this look that says, you racist pig. Um, it's, uh, and, and, it's, it continues to be called American Indian Studies in most universities. Um, so I was just letting you know a little bit of the background on that. Anyway, we're going to talk about Native American Indian people for a while before we get to Europeans showing up, as I said earlier. Now, um, 
Where did those folks come from? How did they get here again? It depends on who you ask. Many of those cultures, many of those tribes and nations have their own set of creation stories. And that's another thing that I want to uh, get to so far as semantics are concerned. Um, I don't like using the word myth and mythology because it automatically devalues what you're talking about. Um, so cosmology is a better word or worldview or belief. Anyway, uh, so far as so far as the uh, the science goes, so far as the archaeology goes, let's take a look at some of the prevailing theories. In order to do that, we have to go way back in time, way back in prehistory, to the uh, the last ice age, which was during the Pleistocene era. I didn't write that down because you don't have to remember that in this class, but you may be, uh, you know, in other classes where you will. Anyway, uh, that ice age lasted, well, it started about two and a half million years ago and reached its height so far as the most ice around 20, 22,000 years ago. And then gradually over the centuries, Global temperatures started to go up, and the ice started to melt. And by about roughly uh, 10,000 years ago or so, the uh, much of that ice had melted, and uh, we had the uh, basically the configuration of the continents that we have that we have today. Now, with all that ice which in some cases was as much as a mile thick. When all that ice started to melt, there were huge changes, huge topographical changes. For example, uh, knowing that water has to go somewhere, right? When it melts, sea levels started to rise. And some of the areas along the coasts of the continents that were lower in elevation became covered with water. Well, this map shows where the, the glaciers were. And as you can see, over in the Western Hemisphere, you've got basically all of uh, Canada and Greenland and the northernmost part of the United States. But notice there that Alaska, much of Alaska is not covered in glacial ice. It was more of a, more of a tundra. Now, this picture, like I said, it show, shows us where the glaciers were, but what it doesn't show us, and what this picture does more effectively, is that North America and Asia during that time period were connected. They were essentially like one big continent. However, as the uh, water level rose due to the melting of the ice, a lot of that land that connected the two started to be covered. So if you look up here in the uh, Bering Sea, in between what is now Alaska and what is now part of Russia, um, Siberia, that uh, the, uh, the areas there that are lighter brown are areas that were not underwater in the time period that we're talking about. Uh, they were above water. So people who lived in Siberia could just, uh, well, you've, maybe you've heard of the land bridge. This is what we're talking about. When I, when I would hear that term, I would think of a narrow little thing. As you can see, this is not that narrow. So people from living a nomadic lifestyle, hunter-gatherers from Siberia who were following, uh, the, uh, following their, their game, the animals that they were hunting, that they lived on, could just, you know, walk right into Alaska. However... Once they walked into Alaska, they were kind of stuck, right? Because that big glacier was right there. Well, um, a lot of them did. And we know that there were a significant number of people living in what is now Alaska. We also know that many of those people and the descendants of those people have a lot of characteristics in common with 
with people in, in Asia, particularly in Siberia. We know that they came over in waves. There were three big waves of immigration. And the most recent wave included people who speak a, a language group called Athabascan. You don't have to remember that either. But that includes Inuits or Eskimos. Also uh, Apaches and Navajos speak that language group. Their ancestors originally were up in the frozen north. Well, uh, being the most recent arrivals, um, it's, it's interesting to note that there are some small tribal groups in Siberia who speak, who speak a language that is very similar to the Athabascan languages, which kind of lends credence to the idea they were part of the final and most recent wave. We also know that a large percentage, and I couldn't find the exact number, but I remember it was somewhere between 90 and 95 percent of Native American Indian people uh, have uh, share genes with that first group of people who were kind of there stuck in Alaska for so long. And then that other between five and 10 percent were part of a part of a later wave. So I found, uh, I found a video that uh, it shows kind of the gradual change and how that bridge between North America and Asia eventually was covered up. Then around 18,000 years ago, as the ice was just beginning to melt, and as you can see in this picture, the land bridge uh, was still there at that time, but the, the glaciers in North America covering Canada were just starting to melt. And as they did, this little uh, channel, this corridor opened up. And if you've ever watched ice melt, um, you know, after, after an ice storm, when it starts to warm up on your car or on your window, then, then you will remember that, you know, a lot of times what happens is there will be a little rivulet first, like down the middle of the ice that melts, and then that gets bigger and bigger until the piece breaks off, right? So that's what was happening here. And those folks who had been sort of bottlenecked up in Alaska for so many generations um, could easily have begun following their game as the animals started wandering down this ice corridor uh, looking for uh, plant life uh, to eat that would have started growing. And then gradually over time, those humans could have made their way down into what is now the United States and then from there begun to spread out. Well, you've probably heard this this theory before. This was uh, first uh, introduced as a theory about a hundred years ago and was the prevailing theory, the, the main theory for, for decades afterward until the last few decades. Now things changed a little bit because some archaeologists began to realize that some of the archaeological sites that existed in the yellow part of the map there in what is now the United States in the Great Plains, for example, that were evidence of human habitation dated much longer ago than when that ice corridor started to open up. So even before that happened, there were humans in North America. So, so how did they get there? Now, uh, theory that is gaining more and more credence is that actually those folks up in Alaska may have traveled in crude boats down the western coast of Canada and done that far enough that they saw land in what is now northern California and went ashore 
and then started spreading out and moving southward a little at a time. You know, it's not like one guy decided, uh, I'm going to just keep walking south and see where I go. Because, you know, to walk from, let's say, San Francisco to Tierra del Fuego, down at the very bottom tip of South America, would be quite an accomplishment. What actually would have happened is that over the decades, over the generations, over the centuries, each family may have moved a little bit further south, so that within a few hundred years, there were people living all throughout North America and South America. And it's entirely possible that they traveled southward also along the coast by boat, and that expedited their trip, that expedited the uh, process of peopling the continent. So, I think the most likely scenario is both those things happened. That before the ice started melting, there were melting, there were people coming down from Alaska along the coast, and they started peopling the continents. And then when the ice corridor opened up, you know, even more, even more people started traveling, traveling southward. Either way, by uh, well, by the time that uh, certainly by the time Europeans arrived. There were a whole lot of people living in North and South America. Of course, when Europeans arrived, they regarded those many, many people already living there as, in their words, savage and uncivilized. But were they? Were they really? Not really. No, because, uh, well, those native cultures in many respects, were far more complex and sophisticated, not only than Europeans at the time were willing to recognize, but more so than you know, the average people living in the U.S. today would, uh, would, would believe, really, at least uh, more so than the average people have been taught to think. There were large cities in existence before European arrival, the capital of the Aztec Empire, Tenochtitlan, had about a quarter of a million people. Uh, it was uh, bigger in its day than any European city at the same time. The city of Corral in Peru had about uh, 6,000 people as early as 2500 BC, which also made it one of the largest cities in the world at that time. More recently, Cahokia, in southern Illinois, right across, uh, right across from St. Louis, uh, Missouri, Cahokia, which was inhabited up until around the year 1400, it was abandoned about a century, a century and a half before the Spanish came through that area, at its height had 40,000 people and was the hub of a large trade network. There were empires um, many of which you've heard of, right? The uh, Aztec, the Inca, the Maya, who had some pretty complex and sophisticated ways of doing things. There was, uh, well, there were some complex political um, frameworks in existence already before the arrival of Europeans. The Iroquois League, technically, uh, the French pronunciation would be Iroquois. Um, their name for themselves is Haudenosaunee. So uh, I go with the Americanized uh, uh, pronunciation. But the Iroquois League, five united tribes speaking basically the, uh, the same language group, different dialects, um, was formed by the 15th century. It was a representative democracy in which each town elected somebody to go up to the national level, to the, to the top level of their particular tribe to represent the village. And then each of the five nations then elected representatives to, to represent their particular nation in the overall league. It was set up with some basic similarities to the... Uh, the U.S. Constitution that came later. I mentioned the uh, 
the fact that Cahokia was part of a vast trade network. There were roads that uh, went great, great distances. There were uh, those trade networks. I mean, there's evidence of things like ostrich feathers from Central America being found in the Great Plains or sometimes like the, uh, the, the pipe stone, catlinite, uh, mined by Native people in Minnesota uh, to, to make pipes. <clears throat> those types of pipes were found all over North America and down into Central America. There were large structures very impressive structures being built. Uh, the Inca Empire produced the, uh, the city of Machu Picchu. Maybe you've been there. Uh, it was lost to history until it was, quote, rediscovered by some Europeans. Um, but it is very, very impressive. Of course, there were impressive pyramids in Central America. There were huge mounds in places like Cahokia. And there were a lot of other things as well. The, uh, the problem was that many of the philosophies and concepts and cultural ways of doing things of the inhabitants of the Western Hemisphere were not the Eastern Hemisphere way of doing things. And so the Europeans did not recognize their uh, sophistication, their complexity, their value, and they didn't really care to because these people were, quote, primitive and, and beneath them in the perception of the Europeans, which hopefully you get the idea that uh, I don't think that was the case at all. And I think that a lot of the... Uh, a lot of the approaches that the indigenous people took were pretty complex. So what we're going to do next is look at some of the cultural approaches that were very different among the native people of the Americas from what the Europeans were used to being exposed to. <laughs> 